The tragic story of Dorothy Perkins, at one time the youngest woman ever to be charged with murder in New York, is a cautionary tale for young ladies who are attracted to bad men, particularly older bad men. In the interest of gender neutrality, young men can also learn from her case. It's also a really great example of what happens when more than one eyewitness describes a crime. If anyone should have been lying dead on the floor of that crowded Greenwich Village house on Valentine's Day, 1925, it probably should have been either Mickey Connors or Dorothy's father, Rudolph. Instead, the dead man was Thomas, Tommy, Edwin Templeton, a veteran of the Great War and an apparently pretty decent guy who was only trying court 17-year-old Dorothy, who ended up fatally shooting him. Dorothy's father served with Tommy, 26, in the New York Guard's 9th Coast Artillery as a supply sergeant. During the war, Tommy had risen to the, the rank of sergeant and continued his military service in the reserves while working as a brakeman on the Pennsylvania Railroad. He came from a reputable old New York family. His brother served in the New Jersey State Assembly. His prospects were bright, which made him, in Rudolph's mind, a good suitor for Dorothy. On the other hand, 35-year-old Mickey Connors was a truck driver and spouse-abusing divorced felon when he became acquainted with Dorothy. His ex-wife was serving a term for felony forgery. Dorothy was 15 at the time they met. Dorothy was attracted to Connors, even though she knew he was married. Whether she knew of his past as a criminal is not known, but even if she did, it made no difference. Perhaps it was her father's relentless pressure for Dorothy to agree to Tommy's courtship that turned her off from him. Perhaps it was something else. When she was arrested for Tommy's murder, the press made no secret that Connors had ruined Dorothy, and there were claims that she even had a child by him. Connors and Dorothy apparently met in June 1924 when he wed the mother of one of Dorothy's girlfriends. After that marriage, Connors moved away from Greenwich Village, but kept in contact with Dorothy on the sly. Meanwhile, the Perkinses felt easier at this, wrote one reporter, referring to Connors's move. Tommy Templeton was calling at the Jane Street house more frequently now, and Rudolph felt and said that his young comrade-in-arms was the man for Dorothy, and Dorothy did not seem to dislike Tommy. Rather, she seemed indifferent to him. Rudolph, though, she might come to love Tommy if Mikey Connors stayed out of the way. But Connors did not stay out of the way. On February 13, 1925, the 9th Battery held a review at a nearby armory, followed by a dance. Tommy gave two tickets to the event to Dorothy, assuming she would invite a girlfriend. The regiment paraded, marched in review past the colonel, countermarched, formed batteries, manned the big guns, reads an article in the American Weekly magazine. Telescope under his arm, Sergeant Templeton sprang up the ladder to the gun-pointing platform. As he stood there above the gun, his eyes wandered to the balcony filled with the guests of the regiment, seeking Dorothy. He found her, and Mickey Connors. Side by side, they sat. Dorothy watched the drill but skipped the dance, although Connors opted to stay. Confronted by both Rudolph Perkins and Tommy Templeton, Connors disclaimed any intentions of any sort toward Dorothy. The crisis of this morality play came the next night at the party, celebrating Rudolph's 47th birthday. Tommy was invited. Connors was obviously not. His presence was not needed, however, for there to be trouble. Just what happened that night, aside from Tommy dying, remains a bit of a mystery because of the numerous versions of the shooting that witnesses recounted during Dorothy's 15 minutes of infamy. Dad was in the hall waiting for him when Tommy got to the house I was dancing in front, but I heard them and came out. And then Dad shouted that he never wanted me to speak to Mickey again. Rudolph once again promoted Tommy to his daughter. Why do you want a bum like Connors when you can have a nice fellow like Tommy? He asked. Dorothy testified that she wasn't interested in Connors anymore, and that their encounter the previous night was really just a chance meeting. I told him I didn't want to hear anything about it. He slapped me in my face. I ran to my room, trying to think. It looked like trouble. Everyone was drinking. People at the party said they assumed she was going to the room to get away from her drunken father. What no one knew was that Dorothy was heading to her room to fetch a 22 caliber revolver, which she had stolen from an aunt in Connecticut. The Perkinses did not know their daughter had a gun, 
but Tommy had apparently seen her with it at least once before, according a witness at her trial. Joseph Harsell, a soldier in Tommy's regiment, testified that after a double date at a local movie theater, Dorothy opened her bag and displayed the gun. Templeton asked her what she carried the gun for, Harsell testified. She said she was a blonde-haired bandit. Then, she said, I am carrying the gun with me for protection in case someone approaches me on my way home. At Dorothy's arraignment, the family minister testified to what he had been told by the family in the aftermath of the shooting. The Reverend Truman A. Kilbourne of the Greenwich Presbyterian Church said that after Dorothy heard that her father threatened to shoot Connors, she retrieved the gun from her dresser, fearing that Rudolph had found it and was going to use it. She returned to the house with the revolver hidden in her sleeve, Kilbourne said. Someone told her father that she had a revolver and he attempted to take it away from her. The New York Times quoted the minister as saying, She resisted, and in the struggle for its possession the revolver went off. Templeton, who was standing nearby, pitched forward, his heart pierced by the bullet. Previously, at the grand jury hearing, Harry Brown, a friend of Tommy's, testified to a wholly different version of events, one in which Mickey Connors made an unwelcome appearance at the party. Things were going all right until somebody said something about another fellow being downstairs to see Dorothy, he said later. Tommy left the room for a while and walked into the hall. When he came back, Dorothy was standing near me when Tommy said, That mutt is downstairs. He's got a rod and he's too yellow to use it. According to Brown, Dorothy ran downstairs and came back with the pistol, saying, I'll show you whether or not my friend is yellow. Brown said Dorothy then fired two rounds and Tommy dropped dead to the floor. He claimed to have grabbed Dorothy and locked her in her bedroom awaiting the police. It was Brown's testimony that led to the murder charge. In her interview with the American Weekly, Dorothy said the shooting occurred before she ever left the house. She slipped the gun into the sleeve of her coat and tried to leave. I thought I would get out of the house and give it to somebody to keep for me. But Dad stopped me. He struggled with me. He tried to hit me. Then the gun slipped down the loose sleeve of the coat. I grabbed for it. It went off. I saw Tommy staggering. He said something. Mother says he said, She's got me now, Mrs. Perkins. Aside from Tommy being dead by a gunshot wound, the only other fact in evidence was that the bullet went through Rudolph's coat and eyeglass case on its way to Tommy's heart. I held Tommy in my arms until they said he was dead. Then I... I don't know. I guess I ran. Prior to Dorothy's trial... Rudolph tried to take the blame. I saw the glint of the revolver in her coat sleeve, he said. I grabbed for it, and she got a grip on it, too. Tommy was behind me trying to stop the fuss. Then there was a shot. Tommy staggered, and Dorothy began to scream. Maybe I did it. Both of us grabbed the gun. No one will ever know who pulled the trigger, Dorothy or I. But it was an accident. When she was on the stand, Dorothy said she took the pistol from her aunt because Tommy promised to teach her how to shoot. She testified at her trial that she fought with her father, grabbed the pistol, without explaining why, and left the house. Dorothy said she was walking around for about an hour, cooling off. She returned home, assuming her father had relaxed as well. It was not the case. The minute I came in the door, Dad began again. As I came up, he called me a name and said he'd kill me. He stopped me and took hold of my hands, and my mother grabbed him. Dorothy continued in her confession. She told police that she did not remember what happened after that moment and stuck with that story during her trial. She claimed on the stand that her standoffish treatment of Tommy was an attempt to make him jealous by flirting with someone else. On June 17, 1925, the jury rejected the state's case that the shooting was murder and convicted Dorothy of manslaughter. A week later, she was sentenced. I wish to say that I feel very sorry for you said the judge. It is to be regretted that a young woman like you should find herself in the position you occupy today. The judge, identified only as McIntyre, appeared to be preparing to lower the boom on Dorothy. You did a heinous wrong, he said. You have led a very bad life for a young woman. You led from a very early life a meretricious relation with a man whom I regard as a beast and a bore. I do not know whether the information imparted to me is correct or not, but I am told that the child at your aunt's house, 
is your child. McIntyre's claim hit Dorothy like a punch in the gut, and she reportedly staggered back into her seat. He then said if she disclaimed the allegation, he would believe her. He once again said he had sympathy for Dorothy, but that he could not overlook the fact that a serious crime had been committed. He berated her for bringing the pistol to New York and for claiming she was a blonde-haired bandit. You are a girl, it is true, but women are not exculpated because of their sex, McIntyre went on. When a woman is bad, she is vicious, and worse than a man many, many times over. There is too much of it. Women seem to feel that they may do that which they please and get away with it. With that tongue lashing, McIntyre sentenced Dorothy to five to fifteen years in the women's prison at Auburn. Dorothy Perkins ended up serving four years of the sentence, during which time she was trained as a stenographer. She was released in January 1929 for good behavior, and the New York Times reported that she had a job waiting for her when she got out. Mickey Connors served a few months in the tombs for contributing to the delinquency of a minor.